Let's take a look at one of my favorite connectors for sort of industrial and outdoor applications. It's the C-Form connector. If you work in construction industry, if you work in engineering, you've probably seen these connectors before, but it's worth taking a look at the details that make them quite special. I'd also like to know where else are these used in the world? If, if you use these at work, it would be worth leaving a comment down below, just saying the country that you're in and whether you use them or not. So these things are designed to be resilient to a harsh environment. And if I squeeze this plastic, you can see that the plastic is a sort of flexible, it's certainly not brittle. Uh, it's a, so it's a flexible plastic that will withstand being dropped from height. And, you know, people, the general abuse that these connectors get, being thrown about, dragged, uh, stood on, and getting wet and stuff like that. And they have a rating, an IP rating, they're not waterproof, but they have an IP rating of IP44 or 54, and that pretty much means that they're fairly resilient to dust and dirt. Uh, but they'll also handle being splashed, and, you know, it means outdoors, you, you don't want to leave them submerged in water, but if they get wet, it's not going to cause an immediate problem. In fact, uh, the best ones kind of drain themselves. If water does get into them over a period of time, they will, with thermal cycling, air expansion, contraction, they'll usually sort of purge it out themselves, but it depends on the orientation. If you have them hang vertically, it can cause problems. If you have them horizontal, it's not such a problem. This one, well, most of them have flaps that cover the socket side. And this one is notable for having this little finger catch, which is a nice feature, actually, because one of the things that these are notorious for is slamming down on your knuckles when you're pulling connectors apart. This is particularly so when it's freezing cold and you're trying to park connectors that will really wrap, wrap your knuckles. So let's take a look at the insides. But before I do that, uh, I want to show you the different sort of fastening systems they have. So this one is opened by taking two screws from the inside and then pulling the insert out like that. And the bit that makes them really resilient to water, this one's not the best for that, but it's the distance, it's the shrouding of the terminals and the spacing between them. Um, I have to say that this connector is not my favourite uh, for many reasons. I, I don't care much for the ones that, since the newer generation that just unlatch, uh, I'm not overly keen the ones that you have to uh, unscrew them and then sort of poke them back down the, the, uh, the inside of the shell again. Uh, so that's the one that it comes out from the inside. This one has a couple of screws in the back that you undo, and then the back cover comes off, and it's got a traditional cord restraint that you loosen the screw, you've trapped the cord in, then you tighten up to grip it. It's worth mentioning that the earth connection in these typically has two screws, and the phase and neutral connection, they just have one screw. But occasionally you find them with uh, two screws for all connections. The earth is also usually stood a little bit prouder, and it makes sense uh, to terminate the wires with the earth longer, because firstly you have to I, I like to double the earth connection over. Uh, I like to double all the connections over. I like to twist them and fold them over and fill that hole in there to grip properly, depending on the size of the wire. But because you need more uh, of the earth in there to actually grip it with the two screws, I like to leave a good extra length in that. And the advantage of leaving the extra length in the earth wire is that if the cable gets pulled, and these things are often subject to quite terrible abuse, then if it gets pulled enough that it's going to actually pull cores out from here, then by leaving the earth longest, the other ones can get pulled out, but the earth will be the last one that breaks. So that's that one. And then we have my preferred approach. It's the little plastic catches in these. So these have a little plastic catch that you push the screwdriver, and when you push it, the front of the connector just rotates slightly, and it on latches like that. And you can see in here, these are so much better. The shrouding, the separation and the tracking distances between these ones is so much better. I like these. These are, uh, which are these? These are the shark connectors. These ones are made in Austria. This one is made in Germany. What's this one? Where's this one made? China. Uh, what about these ones? I have to know now for where these are all made. This one uh, doesn't actually tell you where it's made. Okay, that's okay. So once again, we've got the two screw terminals in there for the 
uh, Earth, and we've got the single one for the neutral and the live. The connections uh, are actually in Boston, this, which doesn't make it ideal for when you're in a dark environment, but uh, then you should have a flashlight head torch anyway. But this is Mart L down here, or it's also Mart L slash plus because uh, they're used for a variety. They're rated for AC and DC use, ultimately, I guess. And they're rated for different voltages as well. And they are color-coded. You'll see that this one's yellow because it's designed for 110 volts, typically. This is a very common one in building sites. And uh, it is rated for the 110 volts. It is commonly center tapped to earth, so it's 55 volts either side. The blue one is rated typically up to about 250 volts. The red one here is a three-phase connector, so it's rated up to about 415 volts. And you also get other colors, including purple, which is one of the more common ones that is rated for SELV, the sort of safety low voltage applications up to about 50 or so volts. Uh, it's got the uh, two screws, the good shrouding, and it's got this system that when you screw this on, you just basically put it in and you twist it and you'll hear it click. That's it, latched. It will not easily come out. That's a great system. It, it saves footing around with screws trying to put these together. The cable grips in these ones tend to be integrated in this style. Let me see if I can get this off. It's not designed to be pulled off. It's designed to have the cable put in then tightened up. But I'll try and pull it off if I can. Ugh. To reveal a combined, this is one of these clever mouldings where they combine two materials. They've got a semi-solid plastic for biting into the cable, but they've all got it moulded around a soft rubber. So this is basically hard plastic fins in the soft rubber, and it goes in these grooves. There's plenty of grooves, so it can actually, it doesn't matter which way and you put it around, it's going to self-align. And as you tighten it up, it pushes that down, and it pushes that rubber grommet in, but also grips the cable. So it grips the cable while also providing a waterproof seal. Very clever. Very dependable as well. Here is another version. Let's see, look at the blue one again. And I still open the yellow one. Uh, it's worth noting, look at the position of the earth pin and the blue one, and you can see this little alignment tag here. The key is in line with the earth pin. If you look at the 110 volt one, you'll see that the alignment pin is not in alignment with that, and that's to stop them being put into the wrong type of socket. So if you've got a 240 volt socket, you can't, you physically can't plug a 110 volt plug in. This doesn't stop people cutting this off so they can use 110 volt plugs for 240 volts. Hmm, it happens. Uh, we'll open the yellow one. This one has a little metal catch, and if I hook my screwdriver into the catch and push it down, you'll see the yellow front housing will rotate slightly. And when it does, that's it unlocked. You might think that looks insecure, but it's not. Actually, it's very secure. They hold together. I've never come across one that just popped open itself. And likewise, when you've connected it, you just basically just slide it in like this and rotate, and you'll hear it click quite decisively. Did you hear that click? Mm. Good, solid connection. The sockets are the same. We've got the different current ratings. These are rated up to 16 amps. This is rated up to 32 amps. You can just see everything's just scaled up a bit. In fact, if I open this up, you'll see that it's just the same inside. It really is just literally scaled up. So if I grab hold of the housing here, I put the screwdriver in and just push like that, it unlocks that, and you'll see that it is just exactly the same inside, just much larger. Larger uh, core size, larger uh, pin size, but really just basically just scaled up. The next size up from the 32 amp is 63. It would be nice if they'd gone 16, 32, 64. Why couldn't they have just added that amp? Because I'm always calling these 64 amp or 65 amp connectors, and it's such an odd value to call it 63. But 16, 32, 63, and then the next step up is 125 amps. And after 125 amps, I think you can get a 250 amp version, but it starts getting unwieldy. It's bad enough that the 125 amp, particularly 125 amp three phase, if you have an extension cable with that, even coiled up onto your shoulder, it weighs a ton. It's really quite heavy sort of carrying about. 
Beyond that, uh, certainly in the entertainment industry, they go up to about, uh, well, they go up to 400 amp connectors, but sometimes with uh, smaller cables if they're they're actually only using it 250 amps, but they go for single cores, so you can connect one core at a time. I already made a video about that. It's the um, power lock connectors. Super rugged. Just everything's rugged, really in the sort of entertainment industry, which is, of course, now where I mostly meet these connectors. Usually with a TRS cable, tough rubber sheath, although often on a building site you'll find a cable called Arctic Cable, which uh, is just rated, it's a PVC cable rated for high temperature variation, you know, it's designed for cold environments and hot environments, but ironically, the pretty much the tough rubber sheath cable, I'm just looking for a bit here, I have a bit here, TRS is one of the best cables for all applications because it's fairly abrasion resistant and it's ultraviolet resistant, it's temperature resistant, it's really rugged, it's commonly used for outdoor wiring. This is H07RNF, you also get H05, the H07 is actually rated for higher voltage so the, the rubber is thicker and quite often you'll find that whereas this cable is rated for 450, 750 volts, uh, you'll often find them using it for just 230, 240 volts because it's just a thicker, heavier, more rugged cable. It's just capable of dealing with the, the pressures of the event industry more. So let me show you some other variants here. We have the panel mounting connector. You drill a hole in the panel, you, mount for, you drill four holes, you put this little ceiling rubber grommet on, you have a 60 amp connector on the side of a panel. That's quite good for where you've got a lot of plugs coming from one power source. Another approach to that is the surface mounting unit that can mount on the side of an enclosure. And it has the socket output like that. It's basically just a surface mounting socket that angles down at the right angle that when you plug something into it, it will shed water in the correct, di correct direction. If you mount things upside down, the water tends to get in here and fill up the socket, so to speak. I mean, I'm saying mount it upside down, but more a situation like this, where you had whatever's plugged in dangling down from a light and then going into a socket, that's not an ideal situation. A uh, good, better sort of range of that would be to have it horizontal or have it with the socket hanging down, then the cable coming down from the light and then going back up to the light just so that the plug was downward because then it will actually sort of avoid filling this up with water, this sort of rim in here, and then it eventually overflowing into that and filling the connector up. The other very rare connector, you know, I don't know why these aren't seen more commonly, is the appliance inlet. This is used in the side of mobile snack wagons. I mean, I wish they were used in the side of mobile snack wagons uh, and other applications where you want power going into a panel. Quite often on the side of a snack wagon where some asshole has mounted one of these in the side because they found it much easier to get these and then they'll have a live plug going in to feed the uh, circuit. And that means that when this is unplugged, you can touch live connections. You would not believe how common that is in the catering industry because they just don't understand electricity. They don't understand power ratings. MD who's worked in the events industry, MD who's worked in the industry in general, who's ever had to deal with caterers will know that their grasp of power and what their appliances use is, is very, very vague. So this is an appliance inlet. This is the correct one. It's basically a plug mounted on the side so that you can plug a connector on like this. There's no real latch for this though. And also, there's that situation that uh, water can theoretically then enter this. It's not necessarily the best solution for sustained outdoor use. Next exhibit. Next exhibit is a common entertainment industry connector. Again, it's a splitter. It's got the 6 amp inlet, it's got a 6 amp outlet here, and two more 6 amp outlets. And that means that you can either have one feed powering three items, which is quite handy in this era of lower current LED fixtures. Or you can actually have, if you it's very low power, you can have a cable come in from the source and then looping onto the next one of these and with two outputs. And it just means you can actually run lots of uh, low power items just by extending these along uh, with short cables in between them. 
So I have to say, I do like the C-Form connector a lot. You may have noticed that. It's nicely engineered, the grip. So here's a different grip, the way. Again, it's the double moulding. It's got the soft, flexible rubber insert. Actually, it's not a double moulding. That's separate, isn't it? Oh, it is kind of moulded on, but it's not permanently moulded on. But in this case, it's a sort of grommet that the cable pushes through. And then as you tighten it down, these little plastic tangs bite into that cable. Sometimes bite in too much. Some people just don't understand that the correct tension of this is you're supposed to tighten up until it grips the cable comfortably, but not just keep grinding it until it's completely squashed and flat, because that does sometimes damage the cables. It bites into them too much and damages the uh, cores inside. But um, one of the most common problems with these with heavy use of these cables, it's just the cable flexing at this point here. You will get broken cores inside. So there we have it. That's a, a smattering of C-form connectors. So it would be interesting to know. Uh, do they use them in your country? If they do, then leave a comment down below so we can actually find out how common the use of these connectors is.